Wow, I really can't believe um, it's come to the end of my five weeks, as Emily has said. Uh, it's been such an amazing time, and uh, the highlight for me really has been to know, get to know so many of you, uh, especially the staff team whom I've worked with daily, such lovely, lovely people. I feel like I'm leaving a piece of my heart here, but hopefully at some point, God willing, I'll be able to come back. Um, so. Today, I will be speaking to you about worship is justice. Now, if you forget whatever I say today, I want you to remember one thing, which is there is extraordinary power and impact in sitting down and eating with someone, okay? So if you forget everything I say, Please remember this, and I'll explain to you why. What does that have to do with justice, you may ask? And I'll explain in a bit, so please bear with me. Now, just a little bit about myself. Um, so I am originally from Malaysia. I moved um, to this country, to London specifically, with my husband and my now nine-year-old son. So we've been here for five years now. And I grew up in a Christian family. My parents, who, who are actually here, um, they are visiting from Malaysia. <laughs> they, they, they flew all the way just to watch. No, I don't know. That's not true. It just so happened they had planned this trip. Um, so they were co-founders of a church that started in the, in the 80s. And um, it now has, I think, pre-pandemic, about 5,000 strong uh, congregation. Now... <laughs> <laughs> now, that sounds, that sounds like a dream, isn't it, for a Christian like me to grow up in that kind of environment. Um, unfortunately, having grown up in a pretty much traditional Chinese culture, I face the pressure of being an exemplary human being and that I should never bring shame to my family. I hear the Malaysian laughing nervously. He, he knows what I mean. Uh, if, if, if you understand Asian culture, that's kind of like a common thread that runs through our entire lineage. So that's what it's like. Um, so uh, with eyes on me, with many eyes on me for, for years, I, I faced a lot of internalized insecurities. I didn't really talk to people about it. Um, low self-esteem, and, and I struggled to find my identity, especially because I felt I was different. So why did I feel I was different? So one of the, the key things was that I had struggled uh, with pretty severe ADHD when I was young. Um, but I didn't, I didn't even realize it until many, many, many years later and was diagnosed officially. Um, so that resulted in me having really um, awkward social skills. But back then, like I said, there wasn't really any awareness about such neurological disabilities. And so I, I came across as weird to some people. So I was, I was actually bullied a lot as a kid. I was scolded a lot as a kid. And even my teenage and young adult life, I just could never really fit in with, like most of my peers did. And um, so I remember hearing people say things like, oh, Amy's, you know, quite needy. She's, she's quite lacking in attention because I actually was just trying so hard to gain acceptance. Um, on top of that, after obtaining my business degree at the age of 21 and working for one of the top global consulting firms, so that sounds like, wow, first big thing that I've ever done. But about a year after that, I quit my job to become a singer. And... That is so, <laughs> I love that, I love that there's a cheer now, but cheer many, many, many years ago, that, that was non-existent really, because I was essentially like a non-conformist, I didn't go down the path of being a doctor, engineer, lawyer, again, Malaysian, I want to hear your nervous laugh, <laughs> so, so a lot of people figured that, yeah, that, was, that wasn't really the usual path, um, singer, okay, um, so I, I, but, but to be fair, I had a lot of amazing church leaders who, who journeyed with me, who mentored me. Um, but there was always something in me that, that made me feel like I couldn't truly feel accepted because of how I was treated by friends and, and how I perceived myself. And even as a singer, I still played it really safe and stayed being a wedding and a private function singer for like 10 plus years while serving as a worship leader in my church. 
So worship leading was, was where I felt like, oh, this is, this is my thing. This is where I feel, you know, I am used by God. And, and, and yeah, it just made me feel really fulfilled. So about six years ago, everything began to unravel. I signed on to what Emily said to become a pop star. And thus began a journey that would, you see, even, even like the, the song that I wrote, um, I, I wrote it kind of like as about like my so-called ex-boyfriend, very Taylor Swift. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but even the words like, can you see me now? It was actually deep down inside. It was me just crying out. I want to be seen. I want to be heard. And so... That began a journey that would completely transform my lifestyle and my career choices. So for the first time in my life, I just wanted to find something that would finally give me real purpose, identity, a sense of achievement, but most of all, respect from people. I was still on that path of finding some sort of acceptance. And so I thought if I was more successful and more famous, I would have more friends and I will gain more respect. I'm sure you've heard this before. So the problem with this career choice of being a female pop singer was that there was so much focus on looks, the constant need for likes and followers on social media, and pushing the boundaries, because it's no longer just about the music, as we know. So with some of these controversial career and life choices I was making, all for the sake of finding acceptance, I started to feel the heat. And on hindsight, I couldn't really express what was truly deep down that manifested in me wanting to go down that path. And the truth is, nobody really knew how to talk to me and journey with me because this was rather unprecedented in my church. There weren't many people in the industry to begin with, and I was the only one who was somewhat controversial. I was, as always, different. So there I was just really disappointed that I didn't have people around me who understood my journey. So what did I do? I left the church, I cut off from Christians, and I even cut off from my family because I felt like everyone was not allowing me to discover myself and who I really wanted to be. So after years and years of trying to feel accepted and validated for who I was and growing up in in a rather suppressive culture, this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I just then began to throw myself in the entertainment world and I got, um, and I got to make more friends there. So that lesson taught me one thing, that if we are not making people feel welcomed in the church, they will then go and find a sense of belonging outside of it. All right, so hold that thought for a bit. So naturally, I started to hang out with people in industry where, whom I thought were my new family. I was out drinking very heavily. I was partying at least twice a week until 7 a.m. sometimes. I was swearing like a sailor. I had really unhealthy relationships and, and I almost got into drugs. Now, mind you, I was a married woman with a three-year-old then. So my husband was just at a loss, but he stood by me because God told him not to give up on me. So with the kind of life I was leading, I basically thought God would want to kick me to the curb. But you know what? Throughout that time, there were two distinctive moments where I heard the voice of God. When I was just alone in the house, nobody at home, and I wasn't really doing anything, I heard the voice of God saying, I'm still here. And in those moments, I would break down and cry uncontrollably because I knew that I wasn't truly happy. So one day in late 2016, I finally woke up from my stupor when something really awful happened to me. And from there, some of our church elders helped me on a journey to restoration. So now even though I knew I was forgiven for turning away from God and for you know, being, leading such a sinful life, I faced the challenge of going back to my church. And I was so filled with shame because I knew that I had fallen so publicly. I was already quite well known in the Christian circles. But I remember walking into church, you know, that first Sunday with my head hung low and then in a sea of people. And when I finally decided to raise my head, I saw a man with his arms outstretched. 
and that man was my father. The prodigal daughter had returned home. And from that day onwards, I knew that I was going to be okay. And not only that, I knew that God had saved me for a reason. He had a plan for me. Now, two lessons that I learned here. The first one is the most obvious lesson here is that this is, this is a story of God's redemption upon my life. When I turned away from him, he pulled me out of a dark pit and he rescued me. However, there's a second lesson here which is a really very important element in regards to the whole area of difference. I had always looked at myself as different. I never really saw anyone like me. This is why diversity and inclusion in the church is so important because if you're not seeing difference and celebrating difference, there will be those who feel marginalized. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect, no matter their past, no matter their education, their language, their career, their sexuality, their econ social economic status, and so on. This is justice, the fair and equal treatment of people. And I have to say, like, one person who perfectly exemplifies that is actually my mom. Like, I, my fondest memories of me growing up, one of my fondest memories is, is whenever I went out with her, um, to a mall or anything like that and, and, and we would sometimes go to the dodgiest of public toilets but there will always be a, a, a toilet cleaner there and my mom will always take time to talk to the toilet cleaner and sometimes she would even share Christ with them like that was my mom she didn't, she didn't care that she came um, she was at that time you know in a privileged uh, uh, um, you know she, 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 she was mi middle class and, and and doing well in, in her career, she would just take time to speak to people, no matter their background. Now, let's look at what the Bible says about justice. Now, we read earlier on, Ben um, helped us read, um, sorry, Andy, helped us read Isaiah 58, verse 1 to 7 earlier. And over there, we saw that God is speaking to a group of people who seek him daily, they fast, and they desire to know his ways. So these are people who seek to be faithful to him and obey him. But look here in verses 3 to 4. Listen. So, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Verses 6 to 7. Is not this kind of fasting I have chosen? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To lose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. So what God is saying essentially is that the pursuit of justice is what is true worship to Him. Similarly, if we see in Isaiah 1 verse 15, when you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. So summarizing this entire thing, what God is saying is that the pursuit of justice is not meant for just a special group of people. This is for everyone who seeks to know and worship God. Now, I've named a few areas of, of justice earlier, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on racial justice. Now, what does the Bible say about racial justice? Galatians 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this is an all-encompassing passage that describes how not one type of person has superiority over another. We are all one in Christ, which means if we truly want to be obedient to Christ and be Christ-like, we are to treat every race the same. Love your neighbor as yourself. You've probably heard this a lot, but what I think is not talked about enough is how do we truly help every person of every race feel like they are welcomed, loved, included in the church and outside of it. You see, the pursuit of racial justice doesn't have to be this big corporate-like idea with strategies that are only easy to implement if you are some prominent activist or advocate or policymaker. Now, don't get me wrong, there is definitely a need for all of that. 
but not everyone is called to be involved in that. I tell you what everyone is able to do, though, to sit down and have a meal with someone, or just to sit down and have a chat with someone. It's so easy to say that we want to be racially diverse in the spaces that we're in, but diversity is not as difficult to achieve as much as inclusivity is. The people we invite to our homes for coffee, for phone chats, the amount of time we spend connecting with people because they truly matter. Now, the thing about racial justice is that it requires time. This is something that I really learned about racial justice. It's not a quick fix. And let me explain with this analogy. We are all like jewelry in a treasure chest, right? Colorful, different shapes, sizes, because God is a creative artist, amen? So some a bit more broken than others and needing a bit more time and attention to help with fixing. So what this means is that when we talk about racial justice, we need to remember that racial reconciliation and restoration is a very essential part in the pursuit of racial justice. A reminder here that everyone has a story. Everyone has different lived experiences that are unique to them. Some of these experiences consist of people causing um, great hurt that really traumatizes a person especially if it happened to them when they were really young. Now, I did a, a course on psychotherapy and mental health a couple years ago, and one of the biggest lessons I learned was that the traumas that we carry, that, that happen to us as children or youth, are carried into our adulthood, which means if we were victims of racism and discrimination at a young age, forgiveness is not something that's automatic in our minds. For some, these wounds could be surface wounds, but for others, these wounds can go so incredibly deep that the process of true forgiveness and restoration cannot be rushed, lest it be inauthentic and forced, that the, the, the traumas and the hurt just come up again and again and again. What is needed is first and foremost connection and intentionality. From there, the ability to share our stories with one another and then the ability to work through some of these traumas and God willing, eventually the reconciliation and the restoration can happen at the end of it. It takes time. God definitely desires for us to, be, to forgive and forbear, but we have to acknowledge that there is sometimes a far more complex that many have to go through before genuinely getting there. Now, coming back to my story, this is where my story fits in with what I just shared. Now, throughout that time that I was far from God and the church, and I just didn't want to talk to anyone, there actually was one person. He was my worship pastor, Pastor Gilbert. He was the only person whom I felt I could truly be honest with. And one of the very, very few people I felt would be willing to sit down and listen to me when everyone else felt, found it really difficult to do so. So what did Pastor Gilbert do when he sat down and listened to me? He gave me a voice. He allowed me to see that whilst I was seeing myself as an outcast, lost, unworthy, confused, rejected, far from grace, sinful, he saw me as a child of God who had a future, whose story was still being written by his creator. Now, even then, because I had gone through so much pain growing up, my ability to truly forgive and be restored is and still an ongoing journey. So with the pursuit of justice, you're not just helping to liberate people from oppression. You're also helping them realize their full potential. What does that look like? Now, in my case again, after I got my life back on track, God opened the door for my family and I to move to London five years ago. I mentioned that. Since then, I did a one-year course at the London School of Theology. Sorry, Ollie, can you put the slide up, please? Since then, I did a one-year course at the London School of Theology. I brought a whole group of students and lecturers to my country to do missions and ministry work. I became a worship pastor in Ealing. And during the pandemic, myself and my street 
were featured on the BBC for the street concerts that I was doing every Sunday for six months. And finally, I produced the Malaysia Blessing that saw not just a Christian worship video that went viral in a country that was majority Muslim, but I helped produce a couple of conferences that united hundreds of churches in the country during a time of crisis. And finally, I am now training to become ordained in the Church of England. Now, all these led by someone who grew up thinking that she would never amount to anything, that she, that she was never good enough, and nobody really liked her. Had Pastor Gilbert not sat down and spent all those weeks in our bustling church cafe, just allowing me to tell my story and without judgment, I wouldn't be standing here today. It only took one person to start the healing process. Because impact just one life, and who knows, you could potentially impact a nation for God. Because you chose to make someone feel genuinely hurt and accepted. You never know what the person you're impacting could end up doing. So the challenge here for all of us is how are we seeing each other? Are we seeing each other from the lens of how Jesus views difference? He sat down and ate with all kinds of people. No, for some of us, you might be thinking, oh, this doesn't really come naturally to me. Well, if I'm being honest, I'm, I've never been a confident public speaker. Especially in my ADHD, my brain often works slower than my mouth. Sometimes I'm saying things and my brain's like, what are you saying? So I've got speech challenges sometimes. I stammer, I don't make any sense sometimes, and even in really small group settings. But you see, God is not looking for ability first and foremost. He's looking for your availability. If he calls you to make a difference and you say, here I am, Lord, he will fill in the gaps for you. He will equip you. You just need to say yes to him. Now, as I close off the worship series today, let's come back to worship is justice. And what does that mean? Revelation 7 verse 9 says, After I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Verse 11, And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. So we are called as one people to worship God, who is, as we discovered earlier, is a God of justice. Jesus came to die on the cross for us and was raised from the dead so that we as an oppressed people can be liberated and set free to live out our lives. When Jesus returns and establishes a new heaven and a new earth, this is what it would look like. Every tongue, every tribe, worshipping the one who sits on the throne. So it says here, this is what heaven is. And so how do we live in such a way that allows people to see what living in partnership with and living under the care of the God of justice looks like? Every tribe, every tongue, coming to the throne room, worshipping together, one in Christ. 